Um, I'd like to introduce to you Grant, the uh, co-founder of Emory. <coughs> Thank you, thank you. I'd like to uh, thank you all for being here, for taking four days out of your busy lives. I know everyone has incredibly hectic lives these days. It's part of the nature of the uh, change in society. But everybody's sitting around doing nothing going, I've got four spare days, maybe I'll go and learn to be an bit coach. So uh, I'm particularly chuffed because with this group, which now takes it over 400, you, you, you guys take it to 401 or something, 402 ambient coaches across the, the planet. So across 10 countries, we've now broken the 400 mark, which is amazing because 400 people every day sharing ambient and aligning people makes you know, a really powerful difference in the world. And this is just the beginning. This is truly just the beginning. Mm, it's exciting. It is exciting. It is exciting. It's super exciting. <laughs> I'm trying to um, contain myself. Doing a good job. We've made a really big effort to compile two pages of questions for you. Some probably more relevant than others, maybe, but nonetheless, um, they, they were kind of brought up in open frame, and Nikki and I decided that we'd sort of handball them over to you. Sounds good. I like tricky questions. And um, I'm going to ask. The people who um, were the ones that brought up the points to ask the question in your own way so that we can get an answer from Grant that suits. And any other questions that do pop up, of course, and this is what Ocean Grant is. He's here all day, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> no, so, 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 we've got all day. Yeah. Uh, you try stopping me. <laughs> so um, who, who wants to go first? Who was first? We'll, we'll go from the list, actually. Why don't we just work our way down? That was my one. So that was, um, when you're talking about the gut brain and digesting information overnight and doing things like that, if someone has parasites in the gut, how does that then affect digesting all that information? Everything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one of the first thing that comes to mind when you say that is I remember reading some Taoist in ancient Chinese literature goes back thousands of years, and they're uh, talking about how with when you have parasites in the gut, it impacts your dreams. So if Depending on the sort of parasites you have, like if you have one long tapeworm, you'll you'll have dreams that are like there'll be a uh, a dragon, something big attacking you. If you have lots of small, you know, thousands of small worm parasites, you'll dream of armies coming and attacking you. So, like it literally, they noted the patterns of, you know, over thousands of years that people's dreams are impacted by the sorts of parasites they have in the enteric nervous system. That of course totally matches the research work I found on rapid gut movement sleep. That you know every 90 minutes approximately over the night time we do what's called REM, REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, and that's when we do largely do most of our dreaming. And uh, what's been found is that the gut goes through a similar process of what they call RGM, rapid gut movement sleep. So just like if you were watching a dog or a child or you know your beloved in bed and they're dreaming, you'll see the eyes twitching. In the case of a dog, you might see the, you know, the, the um, legs and things going as well, and sometimes humans too. It bleeds through uh, from the, the very core reptilian part of the brain down into uh, sort of reticular formation. It'll bleed through down into some of the somatic system. But it's the messages that are going through the in, you know, the gut brain, the heart brain, the autonomic nervous system, and of course, <coughs> we're talking about the reproductive brain potentially, the sex brain. Uh, and these signals are going on every 90 minutes. And that's why we have this old, you know, I don't want to say old wives' tale, it's like an old um, husband's tale, you know, this, this folk wisdom of saying don't eat a really rich meal before you go to sleep because it'll give you nightmares. And I can imagine now knowing all this, you go, well, the enteric nervous system is trying to do some sort of somatic re representation for the head brain. It's attempting to link up, and the heart will be doing a similar thing, with the prime functions to help the head brain make sense of the day. It's going to make sense, it's going to make sense through your sensuality, and so it has to map onto things to do with values, emotions, your relationship with others, how things affect you from a motility perspective, threat monitoring, boundary protection, and a sense of core self of who you really are. So until you really get that deep, digested, you know, I, I get this at my core, you don't truly know something. Equally, the, it's really interesting that, that there are a number of sayings I have written up on, you know, around my house that that I've captured over the years to, to organise and motivate myself 
or that I think are particularly great pieces of wisdom that I should organize my life around. And one of them is from uh, a noted neurophysiologist, neuroscientist uh, called Robert Ornstein. And I recommend any of his books. He's got some stunning books. I used to buy Can you spell his last name? Ornstein, O-R-N, Stein, S-T-E-I-N. Uh, he, he's based in the States, a professor of uh, neurophysiology. And uh, the sort of books that I used to buy, like multiple copies and hand out to all my friends because they just had. Because that's what you do. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't we all? Um, now I write books and hand out to all my friends. So uh, Robert Ornstein uh, has some really pivotal ideas. And one of them is that we're a, he says we're a multi mind, we're not a single mind. The, the unitary unitariness of consciousness, the sense of you know, conscious self that we have, is actually uh, a, uh, a story. You know, it's a fiction. That largely we come in and out of consciousness and we don't, of course, when consciousness isn't there, we don't notice it's not there because we're not conscious to notice that consciousness isn't there. So when they actually track people, uh, you'll notice everyone zones out every now and then a little bit. So the consciousness goes away. When it comes back again, the spotlight of consciousness, the un unconscious mind generates consciousness. Uh, the epiphenomena, it's called of consciousness, comes back. It's, it, you can come back a slightly different person. I mean, we are all a multi-mind and different parts of these, what once called simpletons, come together. So part of this society of mind is the gut, the heart. And we need to be able to have all of our parts aligned, as you know from what you're learning, in order to be able to bring the highest expression of your consciousness to the planet to your life, you have to get the most out of the world. Because if you're fighting against yourself, you know, it's a bit like a tug of war. If you're all got on one side of the rope, you could pretty much do anything with that rope. You could move a mountain with that rope. But if half of you is on the other side of the rope, tugging with the mountain, half of you is tugging this way, you're just not going to get there. So, uh, whatever happens in any one of the systems is impacting all of the systems. Because although we'll talk about them as separate brains, they're not separate brains. They're, it's the whole of you that is made up of these neural networks all completely interconnected. You know, they evolved over time, but they evolved interconnected. What one impacts one, sends messages into the others and influences the others. And each has their patterns of response, and these patterns of response, the brain thinks changes itself. So, because of neuroplasticity, the patterns of response build or adapt the neural network to the information space it's in. So you just build patterns of patterns of patterns. And so consciousness is largely just this little bit of, you know, I see it's like the, the guy on the top of the mountain going, oh, you know, wow, but he's got this huge team of people who got him to the top of the mountain, you know, the, the mountain here. So parasites in the gut, anything that's happening in the gut, whether it's parasites or some aspect of your microbiome, the, the, you know, the trillions of cells that are in your uh, gut, the gut flora, there's more cells in your gut flora than there is in the whole of your body. And the DNA of these cells is being expressed, protein expressed, it's, it's tracking the, you know, the chemical signals and messenger molecules, peptides, etc., of the enteric nervous system. And the gut brain is, is trying to garden it to get the most optimal response. So if you don't have, if your gut brain is completely busy trying to sort out parasites, whether it's you know, screwed up microbiome populations or it's actually physically worms or some sort of parasite, you, it, it can't provide a lot of processing power to other prime functions. Because it's just trying to keep you alive. and keep you, you know, as well as it can in the environment. And when you think about the microbiome or parasites, I, don't like, I like to think about it as just an information system. So a parasite is a piece of information. It's a piece of DNA that is protein expressed into a physical object that is acting in ways that expresses chemicals. And all of these chemicals, all these you know, neurochemicals, neurohormones that are flowing in your system are information. So you're an information system living in an information system. You know, the universe is an information system. And, and evolution works in such a way that really evolution is working against... If I say the word entropy, then you... It, Everyone get a sense of, you know, even though you might not be... Any physicists in the room? <laughs> right, me. Good, I can see anything now. Um, the, the physicists talk about that our universe is an entropic universe. And entropy is just a fancy mathematical word. You know, there's a whole lot of maths to it. But what it means is disorder, a measure of disorder. So the universe we're in is a disordered universe. 
And whenever you do some work to organise, so that cable down there, if that cable was spread all over the room and I wanted to coil it up like it is, the amount of work I do to get that in, into a set of order, I actually do more work to get it ordered than the ordering represents. So every time you try and, and fix something in, in, the, in the world, it actually takes more energy than you create. And so the, basically the universe is, is constantly dissipating to disorder. Within that, order spontaneously arises. And that's called syntropy. And that's what evolution does. Within this disordered system, order spontaneously arises and continues to increase in ecological complexity. And this is what life is. So the universe is knowing itself. There's a, another word for, for syntropy is knowledge. It's information. So we are a representation at this point in time of this incredible complexity of information. And I like to think of it, we'll go red wine conversation now for a moment. I uh, don't know whether we've gotten past the <coughs> second point, third point yet. But uh, we'll, we'll go red wine conversation. And that is, uh, a red wine conversation is like, uh, these are the ones that Mark and I have, but we, we get incredibly philosophical, right? So one of the things that I like to think about is that, uh, and whether, whether, you know, I saw a study about spirituality versus r religiosity, and not many people, I think the number of people in the Western world now that are, would, would define themselves as religious, they follow religion, is, is actually reasonably low, it's 46% or something, and dropping. But the number of people who, who feel that there's a spiritual sense, a spiritual purpose to their life, who say that they are, follow some level of spirituality, some of 86%, it's almost double the number of people who, who, who say that they you know, are, are religious. So whether you're religious or spiritual, there's, there's a fair chance that everyone in this room will have some sense of there's a purpose, or they hope there's a, <laughs> excuse the expression, a goddamn purpose to life. Uh, so, given that perhaps there is, the nature of the universe is it keeps information keeps arising. And I think that is effectively the universe is God. And we we learned about normalizations and de. Not yet. Not yet. You're going to learn about normalizations and de normalizing. They're taking nouns and putting them back to the true verb form. Mm -hmm. And so, I believe the universe is, is God and we are part of that. And so, MBIT for me is a spiritual sense of helping people to be more aligned with the nature of the universe bringing forth information, increasing ecological complexity. Because we have these incredible neural networks, they're neuroplastic, thoughts you think change them, the environment you're in change them, the, what's going on in the gut impacts the head, the heart. Uh, there's heaps of research on what's happening in your microbiome, up and down regulates head-based, you know, in classic psychology or psychiatry, head-based psychological issues. So anxiety, depression, etc., uh, are all influenced by what's happening in your microbiome. And that uh, these messenger molecules and information signals that's going on in the gut are being sent up the vagus nerve through the autonomic nervous system, as well as there's endocrine influences, etc., 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 stuff expressed into the blood, passes the blood-brain barrier, gets in your neuro hormones. Um, and up and down regulates the head brain. So there's nothing that's, that's separate. And that's why it's so important to get the gut <coughs> right first, especially as it's core self. It's doing something like 80 to 85% of immune function, directing immune function. And the autonomic nervous system is doing a fair chunk of the rest. So you, know, you can't separate really, in a sense, immune system from enteric system, from autonomic system. They're all interconnected. So the most important thing is to get diet right. The most important thing is to get probiotics and get your microbiome right, to get any of those sorts of parasites sorted. And a lot of gut issues uh, will be resolved, like uh, things like um, IBD, IBS, even some of the autoimmune, you know, a lot of those are autoimmune, but specific autoimmune like celiacs. <coughs> if you address the issues going on in the microbiome, the enteric nervous system can start to make more refined distinctions on Oh, gluten is not self, right? And so you can actually stop a lot of the, um, the, the issues that are going on at gut level issues, let alone the impacts at the heart and head level. When you speak to people, uh, as I've done, or you look at the research, on people who have active versus passive phases of things like IBS, IBD, celiacs, etc., Crohn's, that when they're in their uh, passive
passive phases. That is, they're not, the, the, the disease isn't active uh, versus when it is. When it's not, they are much more aligned in self. They have more motivation. They, can, they, they become goal-directed. They can follow. You know, they be, think of goals, plan them, and follow them. As soon as they go into the flare-up phase, the motility, the getting, taking action, is taken away. So coming back to Robert Ornstein, one of the things I've got up on my wall is that he says that we are what we do. And I think that's really an expression of if you, what, what is the gut brain's prime function? One of the prime functions is doing, you know, taking action, getting moving, motive, motivation, that motility aspect. And so he says we are, are is the word of I am, identity. So we are what we do. And I, you know, he said this 30 years ago. And I wrote it up on my wall going, well, we are what we do. I better think about, you know, organise my life around what I do because I will become what I do. And that is a deep expression of neuroplasticity. And it happens at head, heart, gut level. And you think a thought once, great. But you think a thought once, it increases the probability you think it again. And if you do think it again, you think it again, you form a yeah. habit. The next thing you know, you've actually grown your neural networks to be adapted to those follow those patterns. And next thing, it changes who you are. So you've got to be really wary of who you, you know, what you put in through this whole system at the gut level, all the way up to the emotions you hold in your heart. Yeah. So do you remember day one, the uh, heart brain prosciutto? Did you tell them that story? Nick, you told. Excellent. <laughs> That's Nicky's favourite story. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the counting the number of neurons in the heart, that, you know, sort of, 30,000 to 120,000. Pastrami. pastrami, yeah, prosciutto, pastrami. As long as it's thin, <laughs> thin slices, <laughs> counting the neurons in there, it's all about you know, being young at heart. If you hold negative thoughts, if you harden your heart to life and to people, well, over time, this neuroplasticity means that those neurons that aren't being used will die off, and those neurons that are being used, you might say abused, if you're thinking negative thoughts and really being pessimistic and holding negativity in your heart, it will cause you to downregulate the number of neurons, to harden your heart, to only have the neurons optimised for certain sorts of prime functions, and you can lose a whole prime function. I've seen plenty of people with narcissistic disorder that are all about them, they value them, but they don't have a relation with them. They don't care about anyone else. It's about themselves. So they use their heart, but only one of the prime functions of their heart. So.